Whitney, I'm fine. How are you? And I was coming back from uh, visiting my sister in the suburbs on uh, a metro train. And I arrived at Union Station about one in the morning. And there was a, a couple who were visually impaired and or blind. I don't know for sure which, which one. And they were uh, pawing their way along the wall because the Amtrak guide that was supposed to meet them when they got off the train didn't show up. Uh, he had his hand on her hand uh, and she was behind him. She was lugging a suitcase. He was lugging a suitcase and he was touching the wall trying to look for a place to ask a person a question like a, a stand or a ticket counter or whatever. At one in the morning nothing was open. Um, I looked at them again and I thought this is absolutely crazy. So I went up to the gentleman and said, uh, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And he said, uh, I, an Amtrak person was supposed to meet me here and we're trying to get on a bus to go to Detroit and they were going to take us to the uh, bus stop upstairs uh, and no one's here. I said, well, well let me do this. Um, I'll, I'll take you upstairs and let's see if, if the bus comes. It was like one in the morning by then or 1.30. So I finally found an elevator because they couldn't schlep up the steps with two suitcases because she, I could tell, was completely blind. I think he was, he was visually impaired or uh, very little sight. We finally get upstairs and I asked someone who's waiting by the bus stop, is the Detroit bus coming? And they said, well, it might have already been there. And, and to make a long story short, the Detroit bus had not arrived yet. I went back and got them on the bus and walking to the apartment, which is like a mile away from there, uh, I thought, how in the world um, did these two people take the chance to venture out into a world where um, everything is is an adventure that you don't know where the next step leads you to because you can't see anything. And so uh, that coupled with, uh, I, I don't go to church a lot, but I decided to go to church the next day. And behind the bulletin where they do all the advertisements was a advertisement for a blind organization that helps blind people. And I said, um, and this is extremely coincidental. Being an analytical person by trade, I thought, well, this this is abnormal in, in my life of of dealing with numbers and quantities. This is this the coincidence is too high. And so I called the number and I started volunteering. That was it. I did, additionally, uh, my youngest brother had Down syndrome and he passed away. So I've lived with a disabled person my younger years. And I understand how complex um, disability affects the entire family unit and the community and society. And that disability is something that is here. It will remain here and needs to be um, handled in a, a very ethical and, and logical way. Who's to say what would have happened to that couple, but I can only imagine if I was in a city that I wasn't familiar with at one o'clock in the morning and I was looking for my transfer bus that I might have missed, I would be distressed if I could see or if I couldn't see. And I can only imagine that you being able to just provide that little bit of assistance and care, I mean, I'm sure that that went a really long way for them. And so um, I, I can definitely hear some direct benefits of just being in the position of open mind of assisting others. But what do you think are some of the benefits of just being able to not only volunteer, but recognize that your effort can really go a long way for someone else? I, I think I, I think I like most people that we take what we have for granted and that um, there are a lot of negatives in our life and a, a lot of positives, but there's always someone else that is going to have more positives than us and more negatives. And we compare ourselves not to those people a lot, but we compare ourselves to um, 
these people who uh, I took for granted things. Uh, I took for granted the ability to get off that train from the suburbs, take that escalator upstairs two floors, start walking home, crossing the street with stoplights, and, and, and feeling fairly safe in that endeavor. And that I, in order to appreciate um, who I am and what I have, a, a comparative study is necessary. I, I'm not as rich as a lot of other people, and I'm certainly, I know that there are a lot of other people that have more things to deal with than I do, and that we need to address those things uh, because if I were in that situation, I would feel helpless. And that's, I think it's important for us to help. That feeling of helpless and vulnerability, um, I think it's also important to, to be able to humanize that and to empathize with, with that feeling, which I, I feel like is why people do become volunteers because they can understand that on, on, a dip, on some sort of different level. And I know too that um, I that you occasionally um, mentor and help, really just in giving your knowledge and imparting your wisdom and being able to help um, others. What are some of the benefits that you've seen from allowing yourself to be open as a uh, mentor to a potential mentee? All of us are are good spirited in heart and that all of us feel good. Uh, some people might claim that's altruistic and that's almost egotistical, but, but maybe it's there for a particular reason. If we weren't altruistic, if we weren't egotistic to some degree, we might not offer this ability to, to say to ourselves, well, we, we need to help another person. Uh, and if it makes you feel good at the same time, maybe the system was intending to do that you're uplifted and you're uplifting another person uh, both individuals both entities both creatures uh, benefit by it you pick up a homeless kitten and you bring him to the shelter or a homeless dog and then the, the creature benefits you you have to be feel good walking home if you teach a person how to deal with the bureaucracy or you help them deal with an issue that is a, over, a delinquent bill or something they weren't expecting. Yes, it's going to make you feel good. And it's making you feel good because you did what you were supposed to do. You helped another person go through life's complexities. Life becomes negative by the quantity of complexities we have, I believe. I think it's no different than that. If you have 12 complexities, your life is more negative than an individual that only has two. And the more complexities you can remove from a person, you're making the person feel freer. And freedom is a wonderful feeling. I think we all know that. So yes, mentoring, helping, whether it's paying bills or reading to them or, or going down to City Hall and fighting because the property tax bill was not delinquent or are calling up the IRS and saying they did file their tax return and all the other things that I've done as a volunteer, it's it's produced a positive in me and I don't believe I, I'm altruistic or egotistical, but I do believe that I it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. And the person that you help, when you leave them knowing that they smile or are happy or you've made them laugh three or four times during the two hour visit, uh, you can't help but making yourself feel good. I, it, when you make another person laugh or you make their life easier, you have to feel good about yourself. Yeah. And I think the, the interesting thing about me is that for years, I felt good because I had a good job and uh, people paid me to give them advice. And this time, uh, I didn't get money for it. And I still felt good for it. And so I said, the money is actually irrelevant at this point in my life because I'm elderly, but money's irrelevant. It's because helping people is a very relevant part of being human, I think. Or, and I know that, um, I'm sure of your background of, of volunteering, you've met some people who are um, more open and I guess um, up front of needing help versus some people who might just have a little bit um, 
more difficulty at admitting that they need help. Um, and I and I was just wondering, um, how how do you approach, I guess, a situation like that? Um, because you're coming from the best intent at heart, and you still want to help them get from point A to point B. How do you kind of gauge how you can approach them based on how maybe open they are to your help? You know, that's been a big learning curve. I, I, I've probably been volunteering for the visually impaired and blind for like three and a half years now. And that every every or group of people have their own cultures and subcultures. There are some visually impaired people that uh, don't ask for help at all. And there's some visually impaired people that ask for a lot of help. And then as a volunteer who's sighted, you, you, you don't know what the person really wants. I've had cases where people have been uh, say, no, don't grab my arm. I don't need your help. Now you could, you could be offended by that, or you could say, well, that's okay. That's just a part of the learning curve because that person's visual impairment is just a part of their personality. And that until we get to know a person's total personality, we can't be the greatest of all friends. And being a volunteer is is a friendly event. So uh, there are some volunteers, some volunteers who get offended by a person saying, no, I, I don't need you to grab my arm, or no, I, I could do that myself. And there are some people that say, well, you didn't tell me when a little uh, bump in the uh, street sidewalk came along and, and you should tell me that. So you've got, I've gotten positives and negatives and it's a learning curve. And, and by the time you've worked with an individual, it's no different than developing a friendship. You could have a start of a friendship and you don't know a lot about that person, but there are things about that person that you know you do like, but you don't know the total individual. And as you get to work with a person who's visually impaired, uh, they will let you know what they want and don't want. And as I tell them what they want and don't want, I had one person as an example who was extremely rude when I was trying to help. And I said, um, I, I won't do that again, but there's no need to be rude. So you, you, you need to be able to say to the person, I, I have feelings also. Uh, you, I want to help, but I have feelings. So let's work together. And if you don't want me to correct your grammar, that's absolutely fine, uh, but tell me in a better way. And that friendship gets built based on these foundations of understanding. Uh, because as we go along in developing relationships, there are ebbs and tides uh, because in fact, we don't know the individually totally, but that's the part of being creative in the friendship process. We end up getting to understand, and that's the key word, understand, how that person wants to be your friend. And that's when the friendship really explodes. Like what you're saying also ties in very directly to advocating and advocacy for other communities. And even now what's happening with the racial protests, like how do you be an ally? How do you show that you do support a certain, you know, demographic, certain community? And I think that what you're saying is, is, is so, you know, on point that um, and, and so I'm wondering um, you said you have been volunteering for the past uh, three and a half years um, what has been some of your um, other kind of personal experiences with volunteering for um, just nonprofits in general uh, I was I was actually volunteering for two, two other not-for-profits um, over the years two other that became very important one was um, an organization that um, supports animal rights. Um, I think there are humane ways of dealing with the, our relationship with an, animals. I mean, we have a dominion over them, of course, but at the same time, a group of people, a lot of majority of people feel the need to eat animals. The piece that bothered me the most was the, the cruelty to them that had nothing to do with the need if you attach the need with the cruelty, I, I can understand that. But when you're just cruel to a creature, uh, that is something of which um, tells me the person's spirit's tainted. And uh, since the poor creature cannot defend itself, I felt the need to volunteer in that particular area in, in, in many ways. 
uh, because animal abuse, um, to me, leads to human abuse and society abuse and the ability to accept abuse in general. And if you accept abuse in general, you start diminishing uh, th cultures and things that you don't know. It led to a, a volunteering with a group in Washington, D.C. that was attempting to lobby things um, that had related to the um, laboratory use of, of, of animals that had nothing to do with the health care. And the last one that was major was a, a, a group of, of teachers um, on the West Coast, that, when I used to live on the West Coast, that were music teachers and that we would get together and find a group of, uh, and there were 3,500 members in this group nor in all North Southern California. And some of our job was to locate children that had the inability to buy a musical instrument, had the inability to pay for music lessons, had the inability to uh, bring out the creativity that a lot of children had. And the music teachers were willing to then give uh, discounts on music lessons or willing to, to buy cheap violins or the group was willing to buy uh, uh, tickets to a, a, a symphony that the kids had never gone to and, and, and to expand their ability to appreciate and love a, a, a thing like music that they actually already loved and that they just didn't have the ability to, to pursue because of economic limitations or limitations uh, and some limitations were the, the parents. The parents tried to avoid the, the, the concept because they didn't, knew it would hurt the kids when they couldn't buy that violin. So they tried to dissuade the kid from actually pursuing music and uh, it, it constricted them. It's sort of like the inability uh, uh, for a community not to expand their well-being because of restrictions, because of economics, as an example, or restrictions because of geography. Primary portion that I got involved with was the ability to uh, provide access uh, to people that probably did not have access. It seems that's kind of like the common connection with all the organizations that you volunteered at. Um, you're helping recognize the need and the humanity side of the situation. And then you're backing that up with uh, this also this will for the justice that it should be better, that that humanity should be recognized and that it should be pushed and continued. Um, but do, do you think, um, do you kind of find yourself going into different roles within your volunteer positions that are kind of more leaning that way? When you look at a person, you don't look at just their eyes, you look at the entire individual and say, um, you know, uh, I could help in particular other areas. I could help uh, have them feel better because of this, that, or the other thing, which has nothing to do maybe with eyesight. In a case that I was involved in where a, a visually impaired person got into a cab and as soon as the cab found out that he was using a tap card, uh, they drove him eight blocks and kicked him out of the cab. I worked with him in his schooling when that happened I said, well, that really shouldn't happen. Let's contact someone. And so we issued a complaint against the cab company. We, the, the young person was smart enough to take a, a picture of the license plate on, a, and the cab number. And we went down to the city hall and we went to room 104 over there, which I think is the disability office and say, well, what can you do to help us? And we got nowhere. So we, and I, I'm not saying that critically. Um, I, I don't know the reason why we got nowhere, but they said they couldn't help. So we went to another uh, governmental unit. Finally, finally, and this person, when they found out that he was visually impaired and he was using a tap card, which is a system whereby they, the cabbie has to wait for his money for 30 days, he got nowhere with a discriminating act like that to kick him out of the cab because he was using a tap card that was prescribed by this city as a way to transport visually impaired people and getting nowhere. They settled with the cab company for 500 bucks and this kid was traumatized. He was going to church that day, meeting his grandma at a church 
and they kicked him out of the cab. I, I think when we talk about those kind of things, we, we go beyond the scope of that produces um, a part of me that says this system is not working. We, 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 we've got to fix it. And even though I'm just one person that is retired from his job and that volunteers very little, I take that as a personal insult because that person that got kicked out of the cab, I like. I treat him as a total friend, even though I'm teaching him just to do his homework. But that was something that came up in his life that was very important. And I think until we as a society get involved, and that's the thing that's important, we get involved without the fear. Uh, unless you get people to confront their complacency, we're not going to change the rights of the disabled person. Complacency, complacency kills. It destroys even the organizations and governmental units that were developed to help it. And this complacency I see all over, all over. But what else do you think is the common mistake that volunteers and advocates and other organizations um, do uh, when it comes to supporting the disabled community? Because uh, I feel like there's a lot of assumption that floats around. I would love to hear what, what you think. Everyone, no matter what our occupation, our primary occupation is to market and persuade. If you're a good lawyer, you have to market yourself and persuade people to use your services. If you're a good CPA, you have to market yourself. If you're a good doc doctor, you have to market yourself. A good artist, even good artists market themselves. Look at, look at how well Picasso marketed himself. Every single profession, no matter what our choice, marketing becomes a very integral part of success. When my brother used to go out with Down syndrome, he died at 15. So we used to, before that, we used to take him out until the shock of the person staring at a person with Down syndrome went away. Uh, my family was very fearful to take my brother out for walks or go to a restaurant. But when you market the disability so that people start seeing it more often and accepting it as a very big part of our society, there are a lot of blind people out there. There are a lot of people that have um, psychological issues that for years now, since the 80s, we haven't cared for the homeless. When people say that most of the homeless on the street have mental illnesses, in essence, because we don't market the need, you market the the individual as a human being, a part of society, maybe we'll be more accepting, but we hide them away. The visually impaired are hidden away. Uh, we uh, Organizations are developed to develop the organization, not the individual. Representation of being able to see yourself in some little way in the organization, the business, and everything else. For you as an individual, that goes a long way. I, you know, for me, Growing up in the South, um, being one of the few, you know, black kids at my school, being able to, as I got older, actually find toys that represented my skin color, having that little bit of representation meant, went a long way with me being able to find my, to feel like I had a place within what was going on around me. And like you're saying, on a bigger scale, I think that without that level of representation and without other businesses and organizations and advertisements, everything else, looking at that representation as well, um, there is this out of sight, out of mind. You know, once again, I feel like everything that you're saying is incredibly timely for what's going on. Once again, what's going on now? Because yeah. the biggest, you know, complaint of any disenfranchised community really does generally come down to lack of representation. You know which also means lack of acknowledgement of personal rights, yeah. lack of uh, funding or care for that community because there is so little acknowledgement of that community. What bigger concerns um, do you have for the visually impaired um, and disabled community? And um, how do you think right now um, volunteers and just be better stewards and, and just be better uh, advocates. 
if 70% of the visually impaired are unemployed and they remain unemployed, people get used to being in a situation and they expect no more from their lives. And when you don't expect no anything more from your life, your life becomes boring, number one. And number two, your creativity diminishes completely. And number three, when you leave the day and say, did I do anything of value? The ability to have value added each day diminishes as it retains that level. If we have a group of people who are disabled that have lost that ability to feel that they've contributed, I think they, that complacency is going to make them feel alienated from society. And if we hide them like we have this ability to do and only have a few people uh, care for them, and then we don't feel the responsibility to have them change. And so unless we proactively start fixing the unemployment issue with visually impaired people, until we proactively start defending them uh, so that they have the ability to bring back that resourcefulness, they, this complacency will make a change in that culture that will be impossible to change impossible to, to change when exactly what you're saying when you're set up in a situation where you're uh, the expectation of what you can contribute and how overall what others are assigning your work and if that is low or non-existent um, that penetrates a lot of different aspects of, of your livelihood and your life and how you view yourself in your role within that society. It's really painful because the, I, everywhere, you know, I hear little bits and stories from just about every country, right, where there's someone who um, might have a severe cognitive, you know, disorder. Their family doesn't know how to treat, you know, that situation. Um, so they are kind of sequestered and kind of kept out of sight. Um, and what eventually becomes of that person is they weren't given a chance or the opportunity to have a place in society. They were taken out of the picture before they could even, you know, be brought into the picture. And which means that, um, automatically the assigned worth of that person is they have no value to our society. Um, that's a I mean, that's that's just a detrimental thought for anyone and pressure for any, I think, community to, to feel. Um, innovation also means self-awareness and that accepting that you don't know everything um, and that maybe there's another group of people that can teach you a thing or two. I think constantly people overlook the value and the experience and knowledge that comes from the disabled community. Talking about thousands, millions of people who every day have had a very particular, very unique lived experience of having to adapt and having to be innovative and having to constantly work outside the system in the box. And every single day, those exact same experiences and it, it, you know intuitiveness gets downcast and overlooked. And those aren't seen as skills. Our society as a whole doesn't value disabled people. So we don't value the, the experiences that come from people with disabilities. From your experience, what do you think this generation, the millennials like me, the Gen Zers, the little babies that are being born this year and having to now face a crazy life post-2020, what do you think that um, current generations can learn from past generations um, when it comes to advocacy? Um, and in particular, um, advocacy for the disabled community. I actually believe that millennials are much more accepting of diversity uh, than my age group. Uh, much more accepting of diversity. 
And that's a wonderful asset to have, a wonderful asset to have. And I wonder why they're more isolated. They don't have, they talk phraseology like networking and um, uh, things that make it sound like partnering and all the other buzzwords that are out there. But I don't think they network and part, uh, partner um, with a, a string of humanness attached to it. So I'm hoping that this acceptance will lead out of the digital world and into the real world that they live in. I, I, I dislike it when I hear that they move to Edgewater, but they never go to Garfield. Uh, they don't ever go to the conservatory Garfield Park because they're afraid to get off the L there. I mean, to, to me, that is something of which is a, is a disconnect. And I, I, I question the integrity uh, of the thought when in fact that, that that's massively disconnected like that. I'm hoping that the millennials will find a person they can trust to migrate this ability to accept the diverseness of the community, including the disabled, and to really put it into action, and put it into action. But again, uh, I can tell you as a volunteer, if you walk down the street with a blind person that's using a cane, uh, uh, there is, I, and I've observed it, there is no difference in the intensity of the stare be, uh, to the blind person by a millennial than there is to a 40 year old or a 50 year old. And so the acceptance that they say they are, um, uh, maybe is there, but because they don't know any blind people, uh, it, they're still alienated. There's still a crevasse there of which they can't, they can't come together with. And until you come together with a disabled group and really understand who they are, I don't think you're going to have the heart and compassion to support them monetarily or voting a government in that will accept them until you get to know that that disability. And I've seen it on, on Wabash Avenue, taking people to the shop at Target, as an example, that they walk by you, they, they stare at the cane, they don't stare at the human being, they stare at the cane, and then they walk straight by you. And they don't smile because they know the person can't see. And so there's this massive disconnect. And it's no different with the homeless. How many times do you hear phrases? Like a, I saw something on public television where the homeless were saying, if they would just say hello or stare at me, but they walk by me as if I don't exist. And when you allow yourself to have a disabled group of people not exist, you free yourself of blame and and and. and it's not your issue. It's not your world. You, you've erased them. If you erase them, you never are going to be caring for them. And that's the thing I'm hoping millennials will get over. I, with my age group, I'm not sure they're correctable because old brains are hard to change. But young brains can change.